This is a cheap MP3 player. Uh, it costs about 20 Canadian dollars here where I live. Um, it's not the sort of thing that's even worth mugging someone for because its resale value is probably nil to a mugger or to a fence or whatever. So, um, it has some value. In other words, I can get it to play me music. Um, but it's not really got a lot of value intrinsically. But it can do certain things. I like having it. I like listening to the music that it enables me to listen to. But is it an MP3 player? This assumes that we know what an MP3 is. This assumes that we know what music is. This assumes that we know what um, playing music means. This assumes that we know what it means to listen to music that isn't widely audible. Um, this is something that only exists in as much as we can actually identify its purpose. There's no ultimate label on this thing that can make it universally recognizable. You have to have something in here in advance for this thing to make any sense at all. Um, if this were to be somehow transported back in time to say, I don't know, medieval China or something, and a Chinese person was to look at this, they'd probably be terrified. The intricacy of the workmanship on this would simply be beyond their knowledge, beyond their experience. They simply wouldn't have any way of grasping what it is. If they played the music, it wouldn't make any sense to them. The music wouldn't sound like any kind of music they'd ever heard before. Um, if they were able to get the darn thing to work, that is. <clears throat> They might just say that this is some weird religious rite. I have a background in classics, ancient Greece and Rome, and everything that you can't identify, you say it probably had religious <laughs> um, usages. I don't know what it is, religious. Something that you wave in front of a crowd to awe them. Well, in medieval China, this would do the trick perfectly. You have to have something already on your mind when you identify something. Things' identities don't exist phenomenally. Um, we know that ultimately what this is is matter, energy, and empty space mostly empty space and matter and energy are functions of each other yada 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 it's all just an I wouldn't say an illusion but it's all an oversimplification or perhaps an overcomplication to say that this thing has an identity um, because really it's, no sep it's not separable from the rest of phenomenal reality according to hard science it is exactly the same stuff as, I don't know, this um, scarf. Same deal. It's exactly the same thing as anything else in this room or anything else in this world. Universe, even dimension, whatever you want to call it. Matter, energy, empty space. But I look around the room that I'm in. That is, if I get rid of this blind in my laundry room, and I see all kinds of things. But these things only exist because I understand what they are and I put identity upon them. And identity is provisional. It's simply based upon what I require of these things to be. I'm not saying that I conjure these things into existence, but I conjure their purpose into existence. Um, at least a purpose in terms of my utility. And everything that I see things as are only identified, they only have identities in relationship to their utility or non-utility or their danger or non-danger or whatever to me. Other than that, they don't really have any existence in and, in and of themselves because again, hard science, matter, energy, empty space, that's it. But Western logic requires that we or Western thinking, reasoning, requires us to assume that things have an identity. Three primal, I guess, laws of logic. I love that term, eh? Laws of logic, as if something made these laws. But anyway, um, identity, the excluded middle, and non-contradiction. We have to have these three for our system of reasoning to work. But there's a flaw, or I wouldn't say a flaw, but an assumption built into these rules that they are somehow unarguable. They're so obvious that we don't need any evidence for them. Well, unfortunately, when it comes to things like identity, we do need evidence. Um, 
And again, identity is based upon utility, or it's based upon interpretation, it's based upon bias, it's based upon all kinds of things that exist here. They don't exist outside. Um, when I look up at the moon, I can actually, a while back I could actually see it up there in the sky, its moonness is something I projected onto it. It's just, it's, it's no different from this thing. But in my own universal view, it is different. Now, this sort of, again, I don't think it's an error, but I think it's an assumption that comes in our own minds a fact, is something of a snare, something of a left turn where you want to go right at the very beginning of our system of making sense of this reality that we're in. It'll, logic will get you so far, and the three cardinal rules of logical thinking will only get you so far. They'll get you an enormous difference, an enormous distance, rather. If you look at the edifice of Western civilization, look what we've built. We've put people into space. We've, <laughs> note the we, as if I had something to do with it. But, you know, supposedly the Western civilizations are the most scientifically advanced, and all of that is based on logic. But, again we're headed towards something of a cul-de-sac because we don't <laughs> we're not going anywhere with any of this science it's just non-stop dynamism that keeps going we assume that it's going to lead us to the truth but it hasn't done so yet we still don't understand what reality is I don't think we're any closer actually and I think the more we learn about it the more we realize how much we don't understand about reality and how much how many flaws there are in our our system of approaching reality. This does not mean that reality isn't there. <laughs> um, I'm not talking solipsism here. What I'm talking about is we have a system of characterizing, categorizing what we see around us, what we perceive around us. Um, and it works for us within certain set parameters. But there are certain things that it cannot do. That's okay, though, for 99.99999% of our uses of it. Um, but again, at its very heart, there is a turn that we better remember is a turn. And it's taking us to places that, you know, we want to go, but might not be where the truth lies. The Eastern way of looking at this is to, is to call that bad turn or assuming that, or any assumption that that turn is actually a step forward. The Indians call that Maya. Maya is taking all of this as somehow solid reality. Um, we um, we do this all the time and we can't, our, our civilization, our, our entire existence couldn't function if we didn't do that. But it isn't necessarily real because there are contradictions built right into it. I know that this thing is just matter, energy, and empty space, but I also know it's an mp3 player. Um, both are right. <clears throat> There's, you know, so much for the excluded middle and so much for identity, ultimately. So much for non-contradiction. And we're cool with that. We already live that way. Even though, in our own minds, we somehow exercise some sort of double think to sort of ignore that inconvenient truth in there. Um, and again, that's, it's human to do this. We have to do this. Um, an ant crawling around in, you know, my basement in the summer, I think they all died during the winter when it gets so cold, but it has a certain reality. It has a certain view of things, a certain definition of reality that works for it. Um, a bird up in the sky has another version. They're radically different, but neither one of them is wrong. The only error, I suppose, that that I, the ant, and the bird all commit is in, is in assuming that the reality that I see is the right one, is the correct one. 
Well, it's correct for me because I am projecting onto it and I can't not project onto it. I have to because everything out here has some kind of value, positive or negative to me. Desire. I am creating the reality that I see around me in a certain sense, in the same way as the ant is creating its own reality or the bird is creating its own reality, its own mythology as to what the world actually is. <clears throat> We all more or less have to do with have to do this. The universe has to be somehow coped with. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying that that's. I said error earlier, but it's not really an error. It, the only error is in assuming that your your um, map is actually accurate. The ant's map and my map are going to be completely different. And the ant might think that my map is wrong. I might think the app, the ant's map is wrong. That is Maya. It's not so much that I'm using a map and I shouldn't use it. No, no, I, I have no choice. I have to. The problems arise when we assume that that map is reality itself. That is Maya. Now, <clears throat> where does that error come from? Where do I think? Where do where do I start thinking that my view of reality is the correct one, is the only possible one, and that other people who disagree with me are wrong? Where does that error originate? One could say that's the fundamental question of existence itself. Where do we make the primal mistake? Is it a mistake even? Well, <clears throat> interestingly, India is always. Um, referred to Maya in terms of either um, a snare or a seductress. Unfortunately, but for better or for worse, the language of Eastern philosophy is almost invariably male. There's tons of female in it, but you know, it's it was it's always generally assumed, but not always that um, you're looking at it from the point of view of a male. So forgive the sexism in this. Reality is um, a snare or a seductive female. Maya has overall female um, attributes. And this can lead, if, it, if you see it as a female snare, the sort of misogynistic Western Catholic view of things that women are somehow evil. Um, but if you look at it as just a seductress, if you look at reality as somehow tricking you into voluntarily surrendering your autonomy to it, um, that's different. Because if you are seduced, you are somehow implicated in your own victimhood. So you can't really say that Maya is bad. If <clears throat> If I, for whatever reason, go out to a coffee shop today or a bar or something like this, I haven't been in a bar in 10 years, but if I were to go out to, you know, uh, go out in public and some absolutely stunningly gorgeous woman were to seduce me and bring me home to her apartment and we were to have a great old time and then I leave, um, whose fault is that? <laughs> whose fault that I committed adultery in the worst possible way at the worst possible time in my life. Um, is it her fault? She's simply doing what comes naturally. So am I. <laughs> um, Western thinking is still, I think, at its heart slightly misogynistic in, in terms of, um, I don't know, that kind of thing, seduction. It's still seen as a mor morality tale. Um, India certainly sees it that way too. Um, seducing a married woman is probably you know, one of the worst things one can do in Indian society. Um, <clears throat> it's not done. Of course it happens, but it's not done. But let's say that we don't place any moral value on that. Let's just say that we're completely distanced from seeing this happen to somebody. Somebody who is seduced by something that was so powerfully seductive that it overwhelmed his or her capacity to think straight. That can happen. Happens all the time. 
is anything fundamentally good or bad happening? I don't think so. Um, in that point of view, uh, from that point of view, there's nothing particularly bad in the seduction scenario I put through, or I um, elucidated a minute or so ago. I wouldn't. I hope my wife doesn't overhear this or watch this, but you know, I think she understands what I'm referring to here. Is there anything bad about what happened? About what that woman did to me? No. She's simply doing what she does. It's in her nature to do this. Um, it's also, unfortunately, in my nature to be seduced. <laughs> um, so there is some kind of mutual desire there. Um, where, when I look out, I want to see things. I want to see a universe that makes sense. So I place identity on things like this. And then it does make sense to me. And it does work. It's verifiable. But have I been seduced or have I actually discovered a truth? Because all of this stuff is only real from my point of view. Does that mean reality is profane? No. Um, does that mean that reality is evil or that the phenomenal universe is evil for casting this illusion over me? No. It's just that's the way it is. That's its nature is to do this. <clears throat> and it's not even that it has some sort of plan for doing what it does. <clears throat> does the law of gravity intend something to happen? Or is it just... It just is. It just... Large objects attract small objects. That's it. Um, I don't think that there's any moral value on... Um, or ethical value on the attraction or repulsion or whatever of things in this universe. My um, mistaking all of this multiplicity, apparent multiplicity, um, for a fact, when it, when it, whereas, exact, whereas in actuality it's a unity, uh, there's no more moral thing. I haven't actually done something that's bad, or it hasn't done something bad to me. The seduction that takes place is not in, intentionally nefarious. Um, <clears throat> and simply, that's just the nature of the universe I'm in. Um, and it's in my nature, I guess, to be seduced by it. Or it's very easy for me to be seduced by it. Um, I mentioned that I am almost pathologically curious. I can't not be. I've, I find it almost impossible not to be. Um, does that reflect any way on my character? Does that mean I'm deficient or anything like that? I, th I think not. I think it's simply that's the way I'm put together and that's that. Um, I think most of us are curious. A um, little bit of gossip goes around. We all want to know what it is. Why do we want to know? Because that knowledge is seductive. That huh, knowledge is seductive. Because we think it's knowledge. But it's not. We think it's real, but it's not. Or it's at least no more real than any other possible spin we would put on reality. Maya. Another gigantic concept. Um, like karma, if you ask me. I think that people don't... I think that, car that Maya doesn't get enough play, if you ask me, in the game of discussing Eastern philosophy. What is reality? What's its nature? Why does it look so real to us, and yet when we get down to atoms and things like that, it starts to dissolve, or when we push it out to absolute limits of the laws of physics, it stops working there as well, on both ends. <clears throat> Why does it look so damnably real? Maya. It doesn't mean to trick us. <laughs> we don't deliberately say, please trick me, either. But it happens. <laughs> Um, and more to follow on this concept, one of my favorites. <laughs>